This video is about QoS bursting for WAN Ethernet on Cisco routers. You may have done some detailed QoS research, but if not, I'll try to make it as translatable as possible. I haven't seen anything on the web about why we use different burst rates. Most posts just say to go with the default. But the first thing to remember here is this is not legacy frame relay. The terminology and commands look very similar, but we're not bursting over our purchase bandwidth or bursting up to or at the CIR. Let's say we have a 100 meg Ethernet WAN connection to our ISP, but we've only purchased a 50 meg circuit. The physical connection is 100 meg, but we're only supposed to use 50 of it. We use a QoS shaping policy on the CE and PE routers to throttle down our bandwidth to prevent it from being dropped by the let QoS policing in the middle between the CE and PE routers. We usually do this and we think of it being about the bandwidth of the circuit, but when we create that config, we're also setting the burst rate. The way we make the burst rate limit the traffic is to prevent the traffic from being sent on the link half the time. So if we're Preventing traffic transmission half the time on a 100 meg link, we're essentially throttling it down to 50 meg. And since we're talking about time, this is usually represented within one second. When the QoS is added to the Cisco router, by default, we would have eight intervals of 125 milliseconds within that one second. This is sometimes analogized as using a bit bucket and tokens that go into that bucket. So as the router goes through time in 125 millisecond increments, wondering when it can send packets, the shaper tells it it's allowed to fill up the buckets half the time. And we don't have to fill up the buckets all in a row. We use the shape average command, so this means it's an average of the one second time frame. We can skip frames until we consume all the allowed buckets within that one second. With 100 meg, we are always sending at the line rate of 100 meg, but only half the time. In our first time interval, we could send it 100%, and in the second, zero, the average would be 50. And this change would be different using different bandwidths, but I thought 50 meg would be easier to understand for this lesson. So when shaping 100 meg to 50, it's eight intervals of 125 milliseconds each, equaling 6,250k per. We could change this number if we're thinking of subnetting. Sometimes we have a small amount of subnets, a lot of hosts. We can flip-flop that with the subnet mask bit. We can have a lot of subnets with very few hosts per subnet. So let's flip-flop the QoS burst rate and make it more realistic to today's needs. Let's say we change it to 125 intervals of 8 milliseconds each. The change here would be that when shaping 100 down to 50, the time intervals would be very small. There'd be a lot of them, though, 400K per instead of 6.2 meg. When you look into QS, you might come across serialization delay. That's the amount of time it takes you to serialize packets into zeros and ones and put them on the physical cable. Well, with Ethernet WAN, we don't have this delay like we have on TDM circuits. So within the first time frame of 125 milliseconds, uh, the amount of data that we're allowed to send on that first interval could be done within the first five milliseconds. That means we're waiting 120 milliseconds till the next time frame comes around so we can send traffic again. And due to the burstiness of traffic, it would be great to always have an empty bucket. This would also kind of eliminate needing to worry about BE configurations, dual bucket, leaky bucket, because the amount of data allowed within each time frame and the amount of time it actually takes to put on the line would be very close. One reason changing the QS burst rate would be a good idea is for voice or VoIP where we have smaller packets. So they would run much smoother and reduce jitter instead of waiting for these long time frames of 125 milliseconds. Another reason is the local LEX or telephone companies usually set their policing burst rate near 4 milliseconds to protect their core network. The good news is that when we apply QS traffic shaping to a Cisco router with a newer 15 IOS code, this is usually ISR Gen 2 CE routers, any Cisco router with a 9 in it, 1900, 3900, etc. The burst rate is automatically set at 4 milliseconds. This would be 200K on a 50 meg link, 
A lot of ISR Gen 1 routers, 2800, 3800, they can support the 15 iOS code, but most 12X iOS codes are around 25 millisecond burst rate when shaping is applied, so you may want to statically set the burst rate if you're on an older code or using AdTran or some other vendor. One thing to check out is whether your ISP is hard coding their PE router QoS burst to 4 milliseconds to match the LEC. They usually run their burst somewhere around 200 to 250 milliseconds, which is way higher than the LEX. Although some smoothing out of traffic would occur between the ISP and the local LEC, this still means you're going to lose some packets from outbound from the ISP's PE router towards your CE in the download direction. Um, and this calculation can be easily done by taking the bandwidth in bits, however many mags you have, add six zeros to the right of it and multiply it by 0 0.004. When the QoS burst rate is matching on the CE, PE, and the LEC equipment, you should no longer have drops within the LEC core network. I hope this helps for anyone having speed issues with Ethernet WAN. Here are some links with additional information on QS bursting.